first of all, welcome to everybody who's here today. Um, this is the second of Alvarado's online events. Um, we're going to be talking about the crisis facing the far-right government of Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. Um, if you, I'm Rachel Boothroyd, I'm a contributing editor to Alborada. Um, if this is the first time you're hearing about us, then Alborada was set up about 10 years ago, um, just over 10 years ago, in fact, um, to offer a different perspective on Latin American politics, the media and culture to that of the mainstream. Um, so this is the second of these talks that we've done since lockdown um, was implemented in the UK. The first of these talks that we did was with journalist Grace Livingstone on the launch of the paperback edition of her book, Britain and the, um, Britain and the Dictatorships of Argentina and Chile, 1973 to 1982, which you can see um, on our website as we recorded that. And we'll also be holding a, a, a third talk on Venezuela on May 19th, um, and we'll be focusing on the recent coup attempts there. So you can put that in your diary. Um, now, just before we bring our speakers in, I'm just going to explain quickly how um, we've decided to set up this um, talk today. So first of all, we're going to show you a, um, a quick clip um, of a program called the Listening Post, which is a program on Al Jazeera, um, just to really give you a sense of how Jair Bolsonaro has been dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so we're going to see a few minutes of that, and then we'll go to our, our speakers, who, who you can see there. Um, and we'll have a conversation for about 45 minutes there, um, and then we'll open up the conversation to our virtual floor. So that means that you'll be able to ask questions. Um, so if at that point you do want to ask a question to one of our speakers, then just either message me directly on the chat um, or um, you can put it just on the chat for everyone to see. Um, and I'm happy to ask the question or we can, I'm told that we can actually bring you in to ask the question yourself. So just put your question on there and we can arrange to bring you in via video if you would prefer that. Um, just to let everyone know that we are going to be recording this um, event. So the plan is to put it on our social media pages later on um, in a couple of days. Um, yeah, so this is being recorded. Um, so I think um, we just get started. And if the first thing that we can do is bring in um, the Listening Post program from Al Jazeera. Um, we have actually shared the link to this video on our social media pages and we'll put on a um, we'll put the link to the full video on when this video goes up as well so people can uh, see the whole program if, if that's what they want. Can we get the um, can we get the program up? A president at odds with his advisors and scientists over COVID-19 who has said that the virus is no worse than the flu and whose supporters accuse the news media of hyping the story. It's not the U.S. and Donald Trump, it's Brazil and Jair Bolsonaro. President Bolsonaro continues to downplay this pandemic even as the number of deaths reported in Brazil surpasses China's. Unhappy with his health minister's more conventional, cautious approach, Bolsonaro fired him. He then spoke at a protest demanding that the military intervene to get people back to work. That's an elected president talking. On the airwaves, however, two of Brazil's biggest media players, Record TV and SBT, still have his back. And whether Jair Bolsonaro is in denial or simply playing politics, they're standing by him. Our starting point this week is the capital, Brasilia. Jair Bolsonaro dedicou alguns minutos ao descumprimento das medidas de distanciamento social. It's not that Brazil doesn't do social distancing. 24 of the 27 states have those measures in place. It's just that the president doesn't do it. So Bolsonaro has been downplaying the risks of coronavirus right now. He's been saying that the media and that scientists are trying to create some sort of panic in society, exaggerating the risks. And meanwhile, he's been going out in public, not wearing a mask. 
and he's going out and he's coughing a lot and he's shaking hands with uh, his supporters and, and taking pictures and selfies and he's setting the wrong example for everybody as to what to do uh, in the times of social distancing. And so in that way, maybe he's the most irresponsible leader in the world right now. And he's also been incentivizing his followers to attack the media. To Jair Bolsonaro and his supporters, the Brazilian media have caught the COVID-19 hysteria bug, criticizing him unfairly for wanting to get people back to work, come what may. Bolsonaro's never had much time for the mainstream media. When he ran for president in 2018, he was a far-right outsider who relied more on social media, specifically WhatsApp, than photo opportunities or press conferences. And it worked. He's borrowed heavily from Donald Trump's fake news playbook and taken it further. He recently mocked journalists who risked infection to do their jobs. This person says that I'm wrong and you have to stay in casa. You don't have to do coronavirus. No? Right, so that, that was a segment from um, the Listening Post on Al Jazeera. And if you do want to watch the rest of, our, of that programme, we've shared the link on our social media um, pages, so you can have a look at that. Now, it's clearly a very turbulent moment for Brazil right now, like we've just seen uh, Bolsonaro's handling of the coronavirus um, pandemic has been really irresponsible. Um, you know, he's worked against kind of his own state governments, he's worked against his own health minister, who we eventually sacked. Um, and we've all of this has really meant that we've seen Brazil kind of um, end up being one of the kind of upcoming hotspots of the pandemic. I think the country's got more than uh, 11,000 deaths, or at least 11,000 deaths um, at the moment because of the virus. But his government's also been in the news this, um, this week because of a brewing political crisis after the resignation of his justice minister, Sergio Moro, um, who resigned accusing Bolsonaro of corruption and particularly of interfering in uh, federal police investigations. So I'd like to bring our speakers in now so we can get a sense of their kind of perspective on all this which is going on. So first of all, we've got Giuliano Fioris. Um, Giuliano is based in Rio de Janeiro. He's one of the editors of Amidst the Debris, Humanitarianism and the End of the Liberal Order, um, which is coming out on Hearst in early 2021. He's also the head of studies um, of humanitarian affairs at Save the Children and is an Alborada contributing editor. Juliana, thanks, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for joining us on the call. Okay. Hi. Thanks, hi. Excellent. Um, and we've also got Brian Mia, who is a geographer who's been living in Brazil for 25 years and he's currently based in Sao Paulo. Um, he works for a Brazilian news portal called 247. Uh, he's also the correspondent for Brazil for Telesor English's news program from the South and is co-editor of Brazil Wire. Uh, Brian, thanks for being here as well. Thanks for being on the call. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Okay. Um, so maybe Brian, if we just stick with you to begin with, what do you what do you make of all this? Um, what's your perspective on everything that's happening at the moment? Is you know Bolsonaro's government um, you know facing a crisis? Is his government particularly fragile at the moment? Uh, yeah, he's definitely facing a crisis, but at the same time, it's kind of like he's using crisis as his means of governing, and I'm not sure. I think that some of the predictions that he's about to fall are exaggerated. And I'll explain why with a little bit of context. Um, first of all, in order to understand why he's president right now, we have to understand the US government's involvement in affairs in Brazil over the last six or seven years. And I'm not doing this to, to try to say that the US is the primary culprit. It's one of the primary culprits. I think if you want to create a linear regression model and rank different levels of causality, it would be definitely in the top two or three, maybe the top, as far as uh, creating the situation we're in right now. But that's, not, that's beyond the scope of a short conversation like this. 
but what we have to know is that um, through the Lava Jato anti-corruption operation, which has had U.S. involvement in it from day one, uh, it's a joint operation between the U.S. Department of Justice, the Security and Exchange Commission, and a local public prosecutor's office and court in Curitiba, a conservative city in southern Brazil. Um, what we've seen happen since this investigation began is a strategic lawfare operation which targeted the Brazilian left, which destroyed key sectors and strategic sectors of the Brazilian economy, especially in 2015. Everyone who's read Confessions of an Economic Hitman knows about the close relationship between big construction and engineering companies like Bechtel and Halliburton with the US government, the World Bank, and the Bretton Woods institutions. And during um, 13 years of PT government rule, uh, the PT party viewed this sector of the economy as very strategic and started extending financing through the BNDS to uh, five big construction and engineering companies, primarily Odebrecht, which is the, the most famous one. In 2015, the the judge at the time, Sergio Moro, who was illegally collaborating with prosecutors on the investigation that he was allowed to oversee and rule on in a bizarre you know, loophole in Brazilian law, which goes back to the Inquisition, basically, um, he issued an order freezing all operations of Brazil's five biggest construction and engineering firms. And what this did was it caused 500,000 immediate layoffs um, over a million indirect layoffs. And according to a study that was published in the BBC, this caused a 2.3% drop in GDP that year, in a year in which the total GDP fall was like 3.4%. So it was a major factor in the economic destabilization, which paved the groundwork for the 2016 coup against mm -hmm. Dilma Rousseff. Now, Dilma Rousseff had issued a presidential order in 2013, more or less, 2014, allocating all of the profits from Brazil's state petroleum company, Petrobras, which had just become the holders of the largest offshore reserves in the world, um, to public health and education. And she'd also um, created a program called More Doctors, which brought in 11,000 Cuban doctors into the country to serve in areas that Brazilian doctors refused to serve in. Now, this is a historic problem with the Brazilian health system. Doctor is an elite position. Most doctors in Brazil want to live in the big cities. And so it wasn't that Brazil had a shortage of doctors. It's just that doctors didn't want to work in rural areas and in slums. OK, mm -hmm. so basically, we had the coup in 2016, which I think if you want to learn more about it, anyone who hasn't seen The Edge of Democracy, the Oscar-nominated documentary by Petra Costa should check it out, um, and also a documentary called The Process, which is really good as well. So after the coup, what happened immediately was that uh, Michelle Temer canceled the allocation of profits to the public health system from Petrobras Petroleum Company, uh, and he issued uh, and he pushed through. Uh, through the help of you know, billions of dollars of pork passed out to different congressmen and senators, a constitutional amendment freezing public health spending for 20 years, public health and education spending. This was called the death amendment in Brazil. And so the health system was already being gutted during Tamer's illegitimate presidency. But then through Bolsonaro's rise to power, which was once again supported by the US, supported by the Lava Jato operation, um, through illegal leaks made by Sergio Moro a week before the elections. First of all, through just removing Lula from the electoral process. He was polling with over double the support of any other candidate. Um, a month before the elections, from behind bars, from his illeg illegitimate political imprisonment. But even after the PT launched a last minute replacement candidate, Sergio Moro illegally smeared him a week before the elections, leaking fake um, corruption allegations to the hegemonic media, which all, you know, also damaged his reputation. And then it came out in January that he was completely exonerated from all of it. But the, the important point to mention is it's a crime to um, 
to make any kind of criminal allegation against a presidential candidate within a month of a presidential election. So it was illegal. Mm -hmm. Moore had been meeting with Bolsonaro's people before he leaked this information. And it's generally viewed even by people like Glenn Greenwald in The Intercept and whatever, that Moro's appointment as justice minister was a quid pro quo, mm -hmm. um, you know, in thanks for removing Lula from the elections. And so Moro got this uh, super justice minister position, overseeing 16 government agencies, including intelligence. And then in February, after Bolsonaro took power, him and Moro together visited CIA headquarters in Washington, in Langley, West, Langley Virginia. Bolsonaro was the first president in Brazilian history to visit CIA headquarters. What they were talking about, we don't know. But after Bolsonaro took office, one of the first things he did was he kicked 8,000 Cuban doctors out of the country, leaving 33 million Brazilians without any kind of access to a doctor in the public health system, mostly in rural areas. Okay, so this is the public health situation that we've inherited through this long U.S. supported process of um, essentially destroying the Brazilian economy and, and um, turning over its natural resources to northern multinationals and, and um, destroying the construction industry to open up more space for um, Bechtel and Halliburton and other companies in Latin America and Africa where, where these Brazilian companies were working a lot. So what we have now is a situation politically, I know I only have a few minutes to speaker, so it's hard to t condense all of this into yeah, of course, a period of time, but politically what we have now is a situation where the left continue, the organized left, which is the social move, the poor people's social movements and the labor union coalitions, which form the base level of support for the PT, which despite all of the problems, still got 44 million votes in 2018. The organized left is a block of around 18 to 20 million people. And it's it, including members of the CUT Labor Union Federation, uh, the CTB and other federations, plus the, the social movements like the MST, the urban social movements like CONAM, Union Nacional de Moradia Popular, et cetera. Getting all of those people together, that's a block of about 20 million people. And Bolsonaro has a block, a, a core base of supporters of around 10 to 15 million fascists, which make up, he's got about 33% support from the Brazilian people right now. Actually, I think the last poll, it's dropped to 27, but among those 27% of the population that support him, about 15% are just like fanatic uh, fascists who can come to the streets and protest. So we have a, we have a situation heading towards the 2022 elections in which if there were free and fair elections, a left candidate would win, you know, just as one would have won in 2018. Um, but it looks like there's going to be increased sabotage of the electoral process. And we'll find out this year when uh, the, the municipal elections happen. There's some in interesting coalitions building up, but we don't know. Really, uh, it's a, there's a general consensus on the Brazilian left that the rule of law has deteriorated since 2016. So we're not sure exactly what's going to happen yet. And um, in terms of coronavirus, is this going to be used in a, in, uh, to make some kind of fascist clampdown to cancel elections? We don't know yet. And that's the situation we're at right now. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Um, Juliana, if I can just bring you in as well. Do you, um, what's your view on everything? How do you think kind of coronavirus is, is, is intersecting with the, um, with the, um, with Sergio Moros's um, resignation? How, you know, how, how rocky is this period for, for Bolsonaro? Thanks for your uh, initial presentation, detailed presentation. Um, I'll, I'll come to those issues uh, on coronavirus and Lava Jato, et cetera, Moro, et cetera. Um, but there's a, a few points that I think, Brian, that link to the title of this, of this event uh, I'd like to address because I think I come at them at a slightly different angle. Um, so when, when Pablo asked me what I thought about the title for, for this discussion, uh, Understanding the Crisis in Bolsonaro's Brazil, 
I said to him that I thought it, was, it could serve as a, a useful provocation. Uh, I think to try to understand what's going on in Brazil at the moment and to use that, that understanding as a basis for the development of left strategy. Uh, we need to interrogate the notion of crisis, understand the function it plays in our political discourse rather than just taking it at face value. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what, are we, what are we talking about when we, we talk about the crisis in Bolsonaro's Brazil? Well, I suppose those of a particular disposition, um, let's call it progressive, would be in broad agreement about what generally constitutes this, this crisis. So let's say a public health situation amidst a pandemic in a country presided over by the world champion or blacks on the Brazilian periphery of uh, the periphery of Brazilian metropolis. Um, economic situation uh, in which the currency has dropped by or being devalued by 25% in two months against the dollar in which potentially there'll be a nine or 10% shrinkage of the economy uh, this year. And in which there's a, a, an increasingly precarious labor market. Um, but notwithstanding the mid onset of the pandemic, the term crisis could perhaps be misleading. And what's this? is that it gives the impression that of, of something unexpected, of a, an unexpected threat or, or threat to stability, um, potentially unexpected rupture. Uh, and that would tend to imply that Bolsonaro is a historical aberration, that he's some sort of deus ex machina introduced on the Brazilian political scene uh, to resolve the bourgeois resentment against working classes in the airports or to help a, a, a smoother transition or handover of control to the US of Brazil's pre-salt oil fields. Um, as they say in, in Brazil, uh, I think the hole is deeper. Um, I think Bolsonaro is a historical invention, but not in that same way. Uh, we can get into this in our discussion. For me, I, I would argue that Bolsonaro emerges as a so mimetic response to Serbia in psychological collapse and his radicalism combined that are important here. Bolsonaro was a, a politician in the right place at the right time, so to speak, or maybe the wrong place in the wrong time. Um, at the same time, many of us do have a sense that there has been rupture of some sort, whether that rupture was in 2018 with his election, whether it was in 2016 with the impeachment of Dilma, whether it was in 2013 with the uh, mass protests and Jornadas de Junho, as they were called. Um, and that idea of rupture is brought on by a feeling that there are extreme but I think we need to continuously share that feeling. Um, it's certainly not all, it's probably not most. And so the different dimensions of our current political drama didn't take form overnight. No, sure. If we think about Bolsonaro's absurd self-portrayal as the anti-politician, that's been enabled by the existence of a distant and corrupt presidentialist system that depends on congressional horse trading, which now Bolsonaro simultaneously threatens and uses for his own personal advantage, personal protection. If we think about threats to democratic order and democratic institutions, these are more readily normalized in a low intensity democracy in which citizens aren't invested, in which contributions if we class base of left, there are underlying organic sociological causes to this. 
uh, if we think about the role of the military, the military didn't suddenly reinvade the political scene yesterday. Uh, in the Brazilian constitution of 1988, the so-called citizen constitution, article 142 establishes that the military is there to protect the nation, to guarantee constitutional powers, but also to uh, assure or ensure uh, law and order if instigated by any of the three powers. What that means is the military uh, in a country that doesn't tend to go to war is primarily a force for internal repression. And this hasn't been, um, this hasn't gone away in the, in the era of, of democracy. In fact, the military was politically re rehabilitated under the workers. But just to talk about this idea of, um, you know, as Bolsonaro is this anti-politician, as this very kind of anti-establishment figure, he's been using or trying to play to that even more um, through the coronavirus pandemic. Now, I don't know to what extent you think that's worked for him or, or not, um, as the case may be. Clearly, it's played well to his supporters who've been out on the streets, you know, in these kind of anti-democracy, anti-Supreme Court um, protests. Is that, is that a political risk, do you think? Or, or how's that gone down with the rest of, the, of Brazil? Has that helped to consolidate his image as, a, as this kind of anti-establishment politician? Or what's, how do you think that's going to play out? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, well, yeah, of course, of course, it's a political risk. He's he's doubling, doubling the bets constantly, um, mm -hmm. and he's he's asking the the judiciary, or the Supreme Court in particular, to 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 call his bluff, knowing that as the stakes are raised, he has a greater opportunity for expanding the field of. Um, constitutional activity, or let's say occupying the margins of the constitution, the grey margins of the constitution. Mm -hmm. Now we can, I think in this, in this regard, I probably, I probably agree with, with Brian um, that uh, I, don't, I don't see Bolsonaro being toppled very easily in the future, be that by an impeachment process or a criminal investigation or otherwise. Well, I really mean those two, those two means, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, um, well, he could he could, he could of course renounce as president, but I think that's also unlikely. Um, but but we need to to think about what he's trying to do, and 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 there's there's debate about this uh, on the left uh, about whether he he really is trying to install a uh, a military dictatorship with the support of the generals who are already part of his government, or whether he's just trying to um, bring about increased authoritarianism by stealth. Mm -hmm. A recent article by a number of left-wing intellectuals from the University of Sao Paulo discussed this. They, they, they use this idea of the furtive authoritarianism. And I think probably at the very least, um, we, can, we can agree that that is what's going on. Bolsonaro is, is, is trying to stretch um, the, the, the possibilities within constitutional order. You can, we can see different elements of that constitutional order having been broken down over a period of, period of time, mm -hmm. uh, for quite a number of years. Um, but I, I think then in the context of the pandemic, we need to look beyond Bolsonaro. And, and, and I don't know how much of what I was saying before um, you, you heard, but what I was the point I was trying to get to is that if there's any... Uh, Thing that we can call a crisis right now. I think it's a crisis of a particular era, and that is a crisis of crisis management. Uh, and that is something that has been common to all of the governments since the early 1990s in Brazil. This, uh, this transformation of politics into crisis management. And alongside the, the implementation of neoliberal economic uh, strategies, there's been a security element, which has essentially been the, the, the application of a sort of necropolitics, control over, control over. But in the, in the context of the pandemic, what we see is that, in fact, government itself obviously can't control death, so it turns death into a, some sort of potential currency. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. betting against death or betting on death, knowing that as, as the number of deaths increases, there will be some sort of recrimination, but at the same time, when the economy collapses, 
collapses, and it's already in, in, in a state of, of accelerated collapse, it can use that to, to, to say, well, I told you so. So, so death becomes a sort of is into his his authority. Sure, great. Thanks, Juliana. Brian, could we just get you to maybe we talked a little bit about the pandemic. Would you be able to tell us a bit more about um, Morris's resignation? You kind of outlined the key role that he played. Um, you know, in the coup in, um, in 2016. Now, as far as I understand it, the Supreme Court's actually approved an investigation um, into uh, Morris's um, accusations against Bolsonaro and people are starting to um, talk about possible impeachment of Bolsonaro. Could you just talk to us a bit more about those corruption allegations and, you know, whether you see impeachment as a, as a, a possibility at the moment? I, th I think you, you're on you're on mute still. Hi, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. It's important to note that this Supreme Court inquiry, it's not a full investigation, it's an inquiry, which can which is taking 60 days, all right? It's also investigating Moro, right? It's got it's inquiring into eight allegations of corruption by Bolsonaro and one by Moro. Moro is incredibly corrupt. You know, uh, the intercept revelations that came out of thousands of social media conversations between Moro and the prosecutors in a case that he was supposed to be impartially ruling on, in which he was instructing them on their media strategy. You know, uh, uh, just those alone reveal dozens of crimes that he committed. On top of that, before the intercept revelations came out, we already knew that he had illegally wiretapped a phone call of the president of the country and released it to the, the media on the eve of Rousseff's impeachment, and that he also wiretapped Lula's defense lawyers so that they could make um, this kind of like uh, flow charts mapping out possible moves by the defense team in advance, which would have caused immediate debarment and imprisonment anywhere else in the world outside of Brazil. But it got him a slap on the wrist from a sympathetic Supreme Court at that time, a warning. You know, so, uh, so this inquiry is not entirely one-sided between Moro and Bolsonaro. Moro resigned because Bolsonaro was trying to appoint a family friend as head of the federal police. Um, during, uh, uh, and the reason for that is clear because two of Bolsonaro's sons are under investigation from the federal police. One, Carlos, for operating a fake news network, which spread all kinds of lies. Like during the presidential campaign in 2018, it sent messages out to hundreds of thousands of people over the WhatsApp social media app. Uh, stating that if Fernando Haddad was elected, the federal government would decide the gender of people's children at age five, mm -hmm. and all kinds of other homophobic uh, rumors and things like that, you know. Um, lies about Marielle Franco too, and things like that. So he's under investigation, because Brazil still has better laws against, um, you know, uh, fake news dissemination than the United States or the UK. And then his son Flavio is under investigation for, um, 10 years of involvement in money laundering schemes with uh, one of Rio de Janeiro's paramilitary militias, which was uh, also being accused of assassinating Mario Le Franco right now. And so, uh, was the, Bolsonaro just, tried to put a child... For people who, who don't know, Mario Le Franco was oh. a LGBT activist and councilwoman, right, in Rio? Yeah, Rio socialist uh, city councilwoman mm -hmm. um, and a bi bisexual... Uh, woman and Afro-Brazilian, a very nice, wonderful person who I had the pleasure of meeting once. Um, assassinated, yeah, so assassinated now, you know, the people who've been accused of the assassination are neighbors of Jair Bolsonaro in his private condominium. Mm -hmm. And there's more and more evidence that the Bolsonaro family is involved in this. So, of course, it's within, it's, it's a conflict of interest to have Bolsonaro replace the federal police chief with a family friend, a close friend of his son Carlos's, as a matter of fact. Okay, so 
more resigned over that, but uh, revelations have come out from a publica, which is an indie news uh, investigative journalism uh, platform in Brazil, that um, Moro had been illegally opening up the Brazilian federal police for partnerships with the FBI. So uh, it's more of like a dueling conflict of interest than Moro standing up for the integrity of the institution, which ironically on his way out, on, during his resignation speech, he praised the way that the PT had um, changed the, the laws in Brazil to give more autonomy to the federal police, you know, the, the government that he helped destroy. So, and also, I think it's worth mentioning the PT also, three, on three different occasions, tried to completely dissolve the military police. This is one of the historic, um, you know, objectives of the PT. But, you know, during Lula's presidency, he had to sacrifice a lot of, of the objectives. But the last time the PT tried to uh, destroy the, or uh, dismantle the, the military police was through uh, a, a bill introduced by PT Senator Lindbergh Farias in 2013. So uh, it's a, PT never had more than 23% of control over Congress and Senate. They had to rely on coalition with conservative partners to get anything done. And unfortunately, they were not uh, able to dismantle the military police who today make up uh, the key base support group and a, da a very dangerous one at that for Jair Bolsonaro. What's the, because um, obviously we heard from Juliano that, you know, the, the military is extremely present in Bolsonaro's government. You know, some of his, his key ministers, um, you know, are you know, retired generals, etc. Is there any indication that the, um, the, the military's moving away from supporting Bolsonaro? Or what's their stance? Um, or what do you think their stance is at the moment? Well, the military has traditionally had different internal currents. You know, even in 1964, before the US backed coup, there were military officers who were against it, who were against uh, this uh, entreguismo or this um, rentier behavior regarding the US uh, imperialist US government. So I don't think that the military right now is entirely unified. Um, okay. What we do know is that eight of 22 of Bolsonaro's cabinet ministers are generals, that there's over 1,300 you know, reserve members of the military officers in the executive branch of the government right now, not even counting the 800 who are in the Ministry of Defense. So it's the most militarized government, at least since uh, Medici, the dictator in the, who came into power in the late 60s. Um, so in, in a way, I feel like, okay, also just, there was a rumor, I'll just explain this really quick. There was a rumor that spread through the um, Brazilian media that started in Argentina from the journalist who first uncovered the relationship between Pope Francis and the dictatorship, you know, that was used in that movie, The Two Popes. He said on a radio interview, that Bolsonaro had essentially lost con operational control over the presidency and that it was his chief of staff, General Braga Neto, who was running things operationally, that Bolsonaro had become increasingly isolated. This spread through the Brazilian media and then Braga Neto announced something completely contradictory to everything that Bolsonaro's finance minister, Paulo Guedes, stands for, who's you know, a Chicago boy, studied under Milton Friedman at University of Chicago in the 70s, lived in Chile for 12 years. Braga Neto announced a New Deal style public works project budgeted at $300 billion, which looked remarkably like the PT party's uh, mm -hmm. growth acceleration program from 2008. And, um, but then Bolsonaro appears to have canceled it. So it seems like there's this back and forth going on between the military and Bolsonaro. You know, Bolsonaro has very close ties. His family has very close ties to the international far right, to Steve Bannon, to Trump. And um, sometimes it seems like he's reading off of a script. You know, the Bolsonaros um, started attacking China for allegedly creating coronavirus in a lab three days before Trump started doing it. It seems like they're coordinating on a lot of things. And, there's nationalist interests within the military still that are probably against this. 
And this is, um, this is probably what's going on internally. But at the same time, I read some very good analysis by Luis Nassif, who's an old um, respected journalist here, who was just saying that Bolsonaro is losing popularity so quickly, you know, he's down below 30% now, that nobody wants to be very closely associated to his government during this crisis. So the military would rather have, would rather be operating behind the scenes in his government like it already is, while letting him continue to be the figurehead. So that if he crashes and burns, their reputation will still be at least somewhat buffered. Okay. Um, Juliana, just if we can bring you back in as well um, on this point. Um, are you still there? I know we haven't got video, but I don't know if we can get yeah, you on the yeah, audio. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still here. I'm still here. Excellent. Uh, and I, can, I can respond to that. There's a few, there's a few things that perhaps are, are, worth, um, are worth discussing. Perfect. Um, so I think yeah, on, on, on the question of how involved the military is, um, how much power it holds, what its positioning is with regards to Bolsonaro. There's, there's a lot of un, there are a lot of unknowns there. Um, in fact, what, the, the only thing we probably definitively know is that we don't know very much about the exact configuration of forces within the military and, and how they are aligning with or against Bolsonaro. I, I have slight reservations with regards to that um, that report that came out or the, the, the notes that came out from this Argentine journalist about the idea that Walter Braga, Braga Nieto would, would now be effectively uh, president behind the scenes. Um, it was it's something that came down from an unnamed member of the high command of the military was passed to a colleague of his and passed on to him. And what was what was stated uh, explicitly was that members of the military would oppose all of Bolsonaro's decisions, which is not the same necessarily as saying that they are in charge. Um, we do know that many of the, the generals that are, that are there around Bolsonaro, uh, what they call generals in pajamas, um, so, so they're, they're, they're retired generals, which mean they don't respond to the same military command. Uh, they don't respond to the same military hierarchies. Uh, and so any sort of organized um, complot is, 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 is quite difficult to, to, to perceive from, from the outside. Um, at the same time, and this is something the, the, the philosopher from the University of Sao Paulo, Vladimir Safatli, has, has said, historically, when there are splits in the military, and there has always, there have always been splits, um, lines, uh, constitutional lines against and, and, and or radical elements that have, have pulled the, the more constitutional elements in their direction. And this is what uh, happened in, in 1964, for example. So it, it, it is possible that certain more, let's say, uh, golpista or coup-mongering elements within the military um, decide that they want to rupture with the constitution with Bolsonaro. It's also possible that some decide to rupture against him. But we need to ask, what would be the reasoning right now? Uh, what what are, what are the interests of the military high command in this moment? So with that, we, we can think about what kind of a project Bolsonaro offers, and to the extent that he offers any project at all except for destruction. Um, historically, the, the military has been a, a nationalist institution. It, it, it was responsible for the programs of national development, throughout the period of dictatorship. And the idea now that we should have a, a, a government with more military personnel than ever before implementing a fundamentalist neoliberal economic program seems rather at odds. Mm -hmm. At the same time, this might well represent a strategic shift in thinking within the military that in fact Brazil is, is, is lagging behind and will lag behind and has no possibility of catching up in terms of technological uh, advances. And therefore, any idea of independent national development um, might be just an illusion. Um, I think another thing that's worth recognizing, and I was, I was in my int introduction, I was, I was getting to this, um, is if we look at individual members of, of the military who were surrounding Bolsonaro, a number of those were people who came to the fore 
um, through their involvement in the peace operations in Haiti. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was saying that the, the Brazilian military's primary function is, is internal repression. Brazil doesn't tend to get involved in wars. And I, I was about to quote Perry Anderson, uh, who, who says that what, what the military lacks in its external throw weight, it, it makes up for in its domestic strike capacity. Um, now, in 2004, when Brazil sent troops to, to, to lead the peacekeeping mission in Haiti, a number of these military personnel who are now high-ranking officials um, were, were involved there and essentially were politically rehabilitated in this, in this moment. Um, I don't think this is just, this is just a, I don't think there was just a mission or an inability to, to do away with military uh, interferences in, in politics under the, under the Workers' Party government. I think there was an idea that you could bring different, different sectors of society uh, together, a sort of concili conciliation program, but more than that, the idea that the military was a, an important institution for the projection of power on the international stage, and that's what Haiti was really about. Mm -hmm. But that does have domestic consequences. And when a number of those generals came back from Haiti, they were involved in, in, in policing uh, manifestations, uh, protests here in Brazil, the 2013 protests. Um, uh, Santos Cruz, who was a commander in Haiti, for example, became the, the head of, of institutional security, led the national force against a number of, of, of street protests. So uh, the, the, the involvement of the military ha has a history. At the same time, I, I tend to think that even though there's so many military personnel around Bolsonaro, um, their role isn't always very, doesn't always seem to be very active. Okay. In fact, more active seems to, seems perhaps at least in terms of mobilizing and organizing, seems to be Bolsonaro's real social, so, social political base, which is in, in the lower ranking echelons of, of the police, the military police, some, some elements of, of the military, but also paramilitary. Uh, and I think what uh, perhaps a, a bigger concern um, remains rather than the military takeover, the paramilitarization of the state. That is not just the state giving it, it increasing permission, granting permission to paramilitaries to do its dirty work, but in fact, the paramilitary uh, 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 overthrow of state institutions through, through po politicians, militias, actually commanding politicians to do their work for them. This is something that, an, inter an interesting article by Matthew Richmond, Be Benjamin Fogel uh, in, in Jacobin uh, a number of months ago addressed. Perfect. Um, okay, well that seems like a good moment to open this up to the floor. Um, if anybody's got a question, can they either put it um, in a message to myself or, um, if they just put it on the group chat and I'm happy to ask it. Uh, we can try and get you in on the video. I'm not sure whether it'll work, but you know, we can try. Um, they've got um, one more, um, Gina Agnew saying, can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, that's fine if everyone wants to just put them on the, on the group chat and I'll do my best to get through as many of them as possible. Can you? Oh. Yeah. Oh, we've got Gina on video. Okay, go ahead, Gina. Hi. Um, so I'm just looking at the moment at the rise in Pentecostalism and how Bolsonaro really did have somewhat of a position in that with him being baptised and sort of like, he really kind of mobilised that sort of movement into voting for him because there's that imagery of him being baptised. Um, but I just wanted to know since like, um, since he has such a like potential and power to influence um, like the lower working class especially um, and Pentecostalism is seen to be a little bit more um, progressive than Catholicism and less restrictive especially towards women how do you think um, his political rhetoric and the religious uh, rhetoric of Pentecostalism will sort of change in these modern times? If that makes sense. <laughs> does does anyone feel best placed to answer that question, Brian? Do you or Juliano? Yeah. Have you got I'd any thoughts? Yeah, Brian, do you want to? I'd be happy to. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, 
basically the rise of neo-Pentecostalism in Latin America as a whole is a result of U.S. Uh, pushback against the rise of liberation theology in the 1960s and the 70s. And, so, and then the Catholic Church itself tried to um, fight back against a massive loss of followers in Latin America in general by creating this kind of like charismatic movement, which is essentially it has all the trappings of neo-Pentecostalism within the Catholic veneer. You know, um, as far as whether neo Pentecostalism is more progressive or not than Catholicism. It's what we, Bolsonaro himself still, despite that baptism video, he still considers himself to be a conservative Catholic. And so his power base is a coalition of conservative Catholic and evangelical. You know, the evangelical churches in Brazil are very right wing in general, but that doesn't mean that all the followers are. You know, um, in fact, uh, Lula's political organizing, since he, he thought about this a lot when he got out of jail, um, uh, well, he was in jail, I'm sorry, and his, his strategy for political organizing, which he's passing on to the base social movements and things of the PT right now, is so focused on working with evangelical, local evangelical pastors and churches and things like that, because he feels like um, with the vacuum that was caused I mean, if, if you look back at the history of the PT and how it was founded and everything, it, uh, the only groups that were really allowed to protest against the dictatorship in the, in the 70s were these class, ecclesi uh, ecclesiastical based communities, uh, which were liberation theology priests and nuns working, and their work helped found the MST. You know, they were involved in labor organization, things like that. And the base of PT comes out of this like, left liberation theology movement within the Catholic Church. What happened is when Ratzinger started censoring and excommunicating liberation theologians in the 1990s, and, they, and Pope John Paul II massively defunded all of these base level groups that were doing really good work in Latin America, there was this vacuum, this kind of like spiritual vacuum created in the in, in a lot of poor communities across the continent. And that was filled by evangelicals, evangelical churches who got a lot of support from the US. Some of them are actually, we know that um, Nelson Rockefeller donated a, a lot of money to the universal kingdom of God church when it was starting out, for example, and things like that. But, um, but what it seems like now is that, uh, the, the PT party and the social movements things are focusing on political organizing within the evangelical community. It looks like Bolsonaro is beginning to lose a little bit of credibility with a base evangelical supporters, especially through coronavirus. You know, so it's, it's hard to say what's gonna go on, but there's basically, there's some very serious structural problems within these evangelical churches in Brazil, which are mainly prosperity-based churches. Um, which, which try and convince people that their problems are caused by their individual relationship with God and not political structures. And so it's a kind of like depolitization movement as a whole and, and um, very homophobic. Um, in some sense, maybe a little bit better on um, women's rights than the conservative Catholics especially in the sense that divorced women and, and or single mothers and things are like welcomed into the church, but also very stifling uh, against women, you know, uh, preaching that women has, have to be subordinate to their husbands and things like that as well. So I don't, I don't see the growth of evangelical churches in Brazil as something that's positive really for women's rights. Uh, at the same time, it's important to remember that despite all of the attention, things like that. Evangelicals still only represent around 34% of the Brazilian population. Okay, thanks for that, Brian. That was really interesting. I'm impressed with your, your ability to answer um, that question. We've got another one um, from Bruno. Did you, yeah, did you want to come in on that as well? There's just a couple of things. I, I think Brian's covered quite a lot of ground there, but, but um, I think two things are important to recognize in terms of how um, 
Pentecostalism and particularly, uh, particularly neo-Pentecostalism plays into politics in Brazil. So, so first of all, um, under the Workers' Party, right at the beginning of, of, of the first term of, of Lula, um, Lula being the politician with by far the most um, a, a, a acute political intuition in this in, in this country, saw that the, 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 the growing potential of, of evangelical churches as a social force, um, and actively courted a number of today's vil villainous uh, Pentecostalist and neo-Pentecostalist leaders, Silas Malafaya, Ejir Macedo, these, these, these mogul come, come pastors or pastor come moguls. Um, and, and unfortunately, at, at some point, though, those turned against him. Now we can explore why that might, why they, they, they might have done that. Um, but certainly Bolsonaro, who, who has a different sort of political intuition, but I don't think Bolsonaro is, is stupid. Um, he, he's managed to, to capture uh, that, that base by playing into a certain kind of imagine, a certain imagination uh, um, and, and certain connections that are built between uh, evangelicals and the outside world. Now, uh, an image that was very striking for many people a couple of weeks ago um, was at this, or when was it, a week and a half ago, was at this protest outside the Palacio do Planalto uh, in, in favor of Bolsonaro and um, against the Constitution, against the SDF and, and Congress, etc. Bolsonaro paraded out towards the protesters, um, accompanied by a, a, a child who was holding three flags, the Brazilian flag, the US flag, and the Israeli flag. You might question why, why that is. But the idea of, of a connection between um, Judeo-Christian cultures, or, or rather countries that represent Judeo-Christian culture, has become partic particularly uh, significant for the evangelical base and the, the connection between Israel and um, evangelical churches, evangelical communities, is also particularly, uh, is particularly motivating as a political force. Um, so I, I just add those, those two points to what Brian said. Well, thanks, thanks, Juliana. And, and obviously, if you feel, you know, Brian or Juliana, if you want to, um, you know, jump in at any point with, you know, a reply, just, just let me know. We've got um, Bruno Falci as well. Um, I think he's got a question about the the kind of this far right rhetoric that's been um, circulating around the coronavirus and how much of that um, provides an opportunity. Bruno, I don't know if you... Uh, yeah, I can comment. listen to you. Yeah, Thank perfect. you. Uh, Rachel is an honor for us from Journalistas Livres, free journalist of Brazil, of being here with such a qualified uh, table of debate. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I would like to, to make a question for all of the, 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 the members of this debate. Uh, since March 11, when the World Health Organization officially declared the, the coronavirus pandemic, a window of opportunity has opened for the extreme right worldwide. Uh, the, 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 the stroke of the fire of xenophobia, of xenophobia against uh, immigrants in general and hatred of the left and globalization disguised by a speech to defend the national economy uh, uh, is, and, and the national economy politicizations is reflected in the striking difference between the ways in which official source and these far-right leaders refers, refer to the virus. In the last weeks, their pronouncements have been growing that threaten the democratic order and the social stability of the country in a terrifying and perturbating scenario of pandemic of the coronavirus. Mostly, I'm, I'm talking about Brazil. Uh, we are media of of Brazil, we are a contra-hegemonic media of Brazil. Uh, in the last week, their pronouncements have been growing that threaten the democratic order and social stability of the country in, 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 in as I say, in a terrifying pandemic, uh, scenario of the pandemic of the coronavirus. 
of the coronavirus. The international health crisis would be added to the economic political crisis that the country was already living before the pandemic. We were passing by very uh, strong crisis uh, since from, from the, 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 the coup against Dilma Rousseff, a very big economic crisis is, go, is getting worse and worse. And now with, with Bolsonaro, we, we are in the worst scenario uh, ever since I was born. Um, and in Brazil, we have already 10,000 dead victims uh, of pandemic, of the pandemia, of the pandemic disease. And not, and we know we are the biggest, the, the, the country with the biggest subnotification and the, the lowest test about the, the coronavirus. So these numbers are much bigger than it looks like. So uh, I would like to ask for the, the, this great, inv this great uh, table of debate. Uh, how do you evaluate this situation in Brazil and its image in front of the international community? Thanks, Bruno. I think that's really, really interesting question because Brian, like you were saying, um, even though you know maybe Bolsonaro's support amongst the general population isn't that you know far reaching he does have this this fascist base so like bruno's saying is is coronavirus combined with this the economic problems in brazil are they going to provide a you know a kind of window of opportunity as bruno was saying for this for this uh, movement to grow well um first of all i'd like to thank bruno for the question and just say that journalists livres is an incredible media organization. Uh, they're really good. They're a kind of like loosely connected cooperative of volunteer journalists uh, that come out and film all of the protests. And it's important um, to film and report on what's going on on all sides of society because, for example, there's been all of this international media about these pro-Bolsonaro protests since the coronavirus pandemic began. Uh, but drone footage shows, for example, the one last Sunday had less than 100 people in it. Now, I was with the labor unions and the social movements of the organized left in 2017 when we put 240,000 people on the streets of Brasilia and closed Congress. And then it got less attention than these pro-Bolsonaro protests are getting in the international media right now. So the work that groups like Journalists Livres and Media Ninja do is really important. Uh, responding to his question about the, how the far right can use the pandemic, first of all, I don't see any distinction between what Bolsonaro is doing, what Trump is doing, and, um, and there's very close similarities to what Boris Johnson has been doing. I feel like right now in the international media, Bolsonaro is being singled out, and Brazil is being singled out for the anywhere but here style of hegemonic media presentation as the UK and US starts to try to re, uh, relax quarantine. They're trying to draw all the attention to Brazil right now, right? Bolsonaro is not doing anything different from Trump and he's not saying anything different really from Boris Johnson. I mean, he's, he quoted Boris Johnson and the UK government at the beginning with this herd immunity garbage, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, so what we have, is a situation which I think you can make very close parallels to Trump, which is that when the pandemic began, a lot of people were predicting that millions of people were gonna die. You know, uh, some people were saying two million people were gonna die in Brazil. So Bolsonaro, like Trump, is betting that the death count is gonna be lower than the initial projections. He's going out all the time protesting against um, the lockdowns that are being implemented by the governors, you know, thank God that they're doing that, you know, but his protesting against it is going to enable him, once, the, once this dies down, to say that it was the leftists, it was the communists who destroyed the economy through their lockdowns, mm. that he was protesting it the whole time. So as long as the, you know, the death count doesn't go totally through the roof, I feel like he could eventually come out even stronger because of this all. For now, he's losing a little bit of, he, he lost about 7% of his base level support in the last poll, but it seems like this is a, 
more because of a split in the right. As Moro resigned, 7% of Bolsonaro's followers went with him, and now there's these kind of like pro-Moro factions fighting pro-Bolsonaro factions. It doesn't seem like um, it was his handling of the coronavirus that caused this drop in popularity. It seems like his popularity levels maintaining stable through this all, just as Trump's is. Mm -hmm. You know, so when this is all over, I mean, right now, okay, so as he said, the, Brazil's the most undercounted country maybe in the world for coronavirus right now. But Brazil does have Fio Cruz, one of the best public health and scientific research institutions in the world, which is designated by the WHO, the World Health Organization, as one of two reference centers on coronavirus in the Americas, the other one being the CDC. They're generating really good numbers based on hospital statistics, which are updated daily in the public system by how many people are dying from pneumonia and, and um, acute respiratory failure and things like that. And they've, they've come up with very systematic estimates of how many cases we really have, between 12 and 15 times more than the official numbers and around double the official death numbers. So we see now we have around probably around 23,000 mortalities from coronavirus. If this stays under 100,000, you know, I hate to say it, but it, it could end up benefiting Bolsonaro, all of this protest he's doing right now, just as it could benefit Trump, you know? Uh, Juliana, do you have any thoughts on Bruno's question? Anything you'd like to add to what Brian's already said? Yeah, a, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I'd also like to, to recognize and, and express my admiration for the bravery of um, the journalists of Journalistas Libres, the, the work they do in, in protests, but, but also in, in trying political conditions. Um, so so I'd, I'd like to register that with Bruno, and I thank you for your question. Um, I, I, th I think Brian's dealt with the, the question on, on coronavirus and pandemic um, quite, quite comprehensively, although I think it's also worth noting that a poll came out today that seems to suggest that 52% uh, um, of Brazilians are, are in, so in some way approve of, of Bolsonaro's response. Uh, that's a change from the last poll that came out. Um, so at the same time as his... his, his uh, as rejection of Bolsonaro seems to seems to be increasing, Th things seem to have changed in this in this last poll with with respect to 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 approval for his his response to to um, to the to the pandemic. Now we can ask why that is. Is that because of this six six hundred real stipend that's been given to informal workers, low paid workers, etc.? Um, that is a way certainly that he's he's going to be able to at least in the short term give the impression that he's working, that he, he's trying to put people back to work, but also providing support for uh, low paid workers and, and, and to maintain some sort of popular base. Um, how long that lasts, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. Also, whether that's overtaken by economic collapse is, is, is another question. But I think a few points that Brian raised um, maybe allow for an interesting segue to, to the discussion of, of what Bolsonaro represents on the international stage. Now, Bruno was asking about how Brazil is perceived by other countries. I mean, right now, obviously, um, not, not very well by a number of, of, of world leaders and, and in the international media. And at the same time, there, there does seem to be some, some sort of connection between Bolsonaro and a number of other presidents, and Brian mentioned Trump, and presumably Orban and Salvini, or well, Salvini no longer a leader, but, but anyway, that, this, this sort of uh, nationalist international. Um, and, and I think it's worth thinking about the ways in which Bolsonaro is similar to these, fig these other figures and ways in which he's very different and, and ways in which the situation in Brazil is also very different uh, and how that affects Brazil's reputation on the international stage, Brazil's ability to project its power on the international stage. Um, first of all, I was saying before in my, in my introduction that I, I think Bolsonaro's appeal in some ways, a combination of his mediocrity and his radicalism. Um, for many people on, 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 in, in, let's say, in, in the suburbs of cities in particular, let's say a, a, lower, a lower middle class, what was conceived of as a new middle class that then dipped back down again into, into the lower classes with the economic crisis. Um, there, is a, there is a sense that... Uh, 
a psychological collapse has, has, has accompanied the, the, the socio-economic collapse. Uh, this idea that was prevalent in the 1930s, the, Theodore Adorno's idea that annihilation is the psychological substitute for the millennium. So when your hopes for the future disappear, you turn to annihilation and more sort of, sort of nihilistic tendencies. I think there is something of that in play right now with the way that a certain class of Brazilian, Brazilians have, have um, come to Bolsonaro. Trump is not the same in this regard. Trump uh, is not is not a, a mediocrity. Trump Trump is a is a billionaire businessman um, from 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 a very different background, and his politics is much more narcissistic than Bolsonaro's. Bolsonaro is uh, uh, let's say a, perhaps a more conventional populist in the way that he manages to offer images and symbols to the people that reflect back to them what they see in themselves. And sometimes that might be the worst of what they see in themselves, but it doesn't matter. Um, and and I, I think this this explains something of the way that Bolsonaro goes about his 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 development of tactics. Strategy doesn't really exist. It doesn't need to exist when there's no future. When it se seems that there's no future, because essentially what Bolsonaro needs to do and wants to do is to govern by symbols until 2022. He's per he's permanently in campaign mode. Right. Uh, okay. That that might be a, you know Trump is also permanently in campaign mode. In, in, in some way, um, but but there's there's certainly a sense that Bolsonaro's only way of of governing is is by symbols. He doesn't have a particular political substance or content or even program, and so to the extent that his government needs that, it's been uh, contracted, subcontracted through appointments of uh, Sergio Moro in the Ministry of Justice, um, through Paulo Guedes in in the Ministry in the Ministry of Economy. Uh, and this is another, referring to the Ministry of Economy, this is another, another way in which you see a quite stark difference between, let's say, Trump and Bolsonaro. And why I think the early um, comparison of Trump to Bolsonaro is, is the Trump of the tropic, tropics was a, was a bit misconceived, a bit hasty, mm. perhaps. What we see here is a reflection of uh, the Brazilian elite's tendency um, to, to support neoliberal programs, which you don't see of the far right in, in, in the US. A, a certain kind of establishment in the US, yes, let's say the democratic or the, the liberal establishment, yes. But here in Brazil, the far right is a neoliberal far right. And that might be a, a, a characteristic of, of, of populism on the periphery, let's say. Mm. Um, but what we have here is, is quite different in, in the sense that we have an authoritarianism that's being uh, introduced, uh, increasingly introduced, accompanied by a neoliberal program. Uh, and that uh, the reason why I raise this now in relation to the pandemic is because what Bolsonaro finds himself in is, 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 is a, a, a situation of extreme tension. Because in order to sustain his popular base, he needs to be providing some sort of stimulus. He needs to be providing these stipends. And it wasn't, like I should mention, of his own choosing to provide these stipends. Um, but he needs to play that, he needs to, to, to present that as, as a gesture to, to his popular base. And at the same time, to keep business on board, which is, a clear, is, is, is an important pillar of his government, to keep big business on board, he needs to be, be progressing, advancing rapidly with the reform program, which is a neoliberal, neoliberal reform program. And this is very different to what's going on in other contexts. We've yeah, got... Can I just respond to something really quick? I just yeah, want to clarify sure. something. Yeah. Go on, Brian. I'm but not it... trying to imply that Bolsonaro is the Brazilian Trump or the Trump of the tropics. Bolsonaro is clearly what Noam Cham uh, Chomsky coined in the 1970s, a sub-fascist. He's a fascist who's subordinate to Trump, subordinate to the United States. He loves Trump. So he's not narcissistic in the same sense that Trump is because he puts himself below Trump and below the United States. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. And another thing I just... Like to say, I'm looking at the CNT poll that was released today, and it says Bolsonaro's disapproval. The percentage of the Brazilian population that say he's doing poorly or horribly has grown 12% since January to 43.4. You know, with 32% thinking he's doing a good job. I don't know where the 53% number comes from. Okay, I just wanted to so interject. So. So we've got um, we've got two more questions to get through until the end, and we haven't got 
too much time to do that. So we've got a really interesting one from um, Simone Santa Barbara. Um, but I'm going to leave that one till the end because I think it's a nice one to leave on. So in the interim, we've got Matty Rose to everyone on the chat. And he says, um, one of the interesting aspects of the coronavirus crisis in Brazil has been the conflict between the pro-lockdown far-right governors and former Bolsonaro allies Witzel and Doria of Doria del Rio and SP states and the anti-lockdown Bolsonaro. Given that it could be said that both Witzel and Doria have designs on a presidential run in the next elections, how might this conflict affect the balance of forces on the right, especially considering the fact that both would need the support of 15 to 20% of the electorate who are also Bolsonarista fascist hardliners. What are your thoughts on the possibility of a Sergio Moro presidential run? So, um, I don't know. Juliana, do you want to come back in on that? And then we'll go to Brian. Uh, I'd, I'd happily come back in on that. I should just, sorry, just to respond to Brian's point. I'm not saying that uh, his, his approval, overall approval has, has shot up to 50, 52%. What I'm saying is that, the, the, the study seems to show that it's actually 51.7% approve the government's uh, response to the pandemic um, and 42.3% are, are critical of it. So I, 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 this, is, this is something I saw just before, the, just before the, the, this, this debate started, this discussion started, so I have to go, go back over and see, see what the research methodology is for that. But it's not, it's not a general approval of the government or of Bolsonaro. Um, and, and it's, it's also worth mentioning, actually, that, that uh, this approval of, of or rather, approval of Bolsonaro and the government uh, are, not, are not exactly the same thing. Um, which actually, I suppose, is, offers a neat segue into discussion of Sergio Moro, because Sergio Moro, I think, as, as Brian mentioned, um, left the government recently and, and left in quite bombastic fashion. And there was a dip in the popularity uh, of sorry, have you still got me? You seem to have frozen. Oh God! Hello. Hello. Hi. Have you still got me? Yeah, I can still hear you. Sorry, I don't know where where it cuts off. Um, what? Where, where, where did where did it cut off? No, I think no, we can still hear you. I think you're still right. there. You're fine. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so yeah, I said that there, there was a dip in in, um, in the aftermath of of, of Moro's exit from the government, a dip in popularity of, of Bolsonaro's government, um, and a, a dip in popularity of, of Bolsonaro. I, I think we should put that also in the context of, of um, longer term undulations in in his popularity, because it hasn't dipped so much that it couldn't go back up more or less to the sort of thirty percent. That, that it, it's been at for quite a long, long time. However, it, it does show the importance of a figure like Moro to the government. And this is, has been absolutely central to Bolsonaro's calculations with, with respect to Moro. There seems to have been some sort of promise to Sergio Moro that if he came on board as Minister of Justice, he would be the next person inserted into the Supreme Court. Mm. And at the same time in the background, there's been a lingering sense that Moro has designs on, on a different sort of office, in fact, on political office and potentially the presidency. And so uh, and about a year ago, when Bolsonaro exposed this promise to the press, told the press that he had, he had agreed with Moro in a quid pro quo, that Moro would be able to be the next person to, to, to join the Supreme Court. This also seemed to be a way of um, perhaps undermining Moro's possibilities of, of launching some sort of future presidential campaign. Right now, Moro is not uh, is not declaring any political ambitions, but he is extremely ambitious. So I think that is something we should we should um, keep an eye on. Whether he would be able to, you know, what what political party he would join, whether he'd be able to 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 be a, the, the leading candidate in a uh, in, a, in a presidential race ticket, or whether he would be supporting another candidate is, is a question, I think, as well, that's yet, yet to be answered. Certainly, the, the two figures that were mentioned in that question, the governors, uh, uh, Jean Doria and Wilson Witzel, do also have designs on, on the presidency, ambitions to, to run for presidency, and, and it's exactly for that reason that we've seen 
um, social isolation used as a, or, or the response to the pandemic used as a political football in, in, this, in this context. Um, João Doria, who used the campaign slogan Bolso Doria to associate himself with Bolsonaro in, in the 2018 election, suddenly now becomes arch rival of, of Bolsonaro. Now there's, there's a timing there because he, he obviously sees that Bolsonaro's popularity is waning slightly and, and, and he, he wants to um, start to build his own, his own campaign. I'm not sure that, that Doria really has a, a sufficient uh, popular base to be able to, to launch a, a credible uh, campaign on the, on the presidency, and, and Wilson Witzel almost certainly doesn't. However, a Doria, Doria with a Moro would be a rather different prospect. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know whether that, that's even a possibility, but, but that would be a different prospect, and, and almost certainly a, a very difficult uh, proposition for the for the left to take on um in in the presidential campaign uh brian what are you, what are your thoughts do you see this kind of um do you see a moro a presidential bid do you see a potential split in um in the right wing what what do you think you're on mute again i think hold on i'm sorry yeah i mean we, these um, pot-banging protests that have been going on every night during Bolsonaro's address to the nation now are middle-class, essentially middle-class protests. And a lot of the people engage, and it's a traditionally right-wing form of middle-class protest that was used against Dilma Rousseff, for example, during the impeachment. Bolsonaro has already lost the traditional bourgeois, you know, uh, conservative population in Brazil. He's, he's already lost them. Um, Doria is the last, you know, uh, powerful figure in the PSDB party, which is historically aligned very strongly with the U.S. Democratic Party, which imploded after the coup against Dilma Rousseff. You know, the, the, um, and part of it, I think, has to do with the fact that Hillary Clinton lost re-election. You know, during the Days around the coup, top officials from the PSDB party flew up to meet with John Kerry, Secretary of State, uh, the Intercept documented at the time, you know. Um, they were negotiating, they, they were banking on a Clinton victory. And so, and also uh, the Lava Jato operation, which was led by Sergio Moro, which transformed Moro into this golden boy in the international bourgeois media, was also something that started during a democratic regime. And so I feel like Moro's leaving the Bolsonaro government um, also represents a split in the American right, because um, Doria and Bolsonaro together appeased both the Trump faction of the US government and the DNC, mm -hmm. you know, which is why Moro was like a golden boy in America's quarterly and places, and, these integral state actors. And so that, I think that's interesting. I think that Doria as governor of Sao Paulo, his handling of the coronavirus crisis has been pretty good. Thank God that this political conflict is going on right now between him and Bolsonaro, frankly. You know, thank God that he's broken from Bolsonaro and that he's using coronavirus uh, pandemic as a way to increase his uh, political prospects in the future, you know, because, um, Right now, everyone was predicting that the public, that the hospital system would collapse in mid-April in Sao Paulo. Right now, our hospital system is only at 67, the ICU units are only at 67% capacity statewide. So they built a lot of field hospitals early and staffed them with people, unlike other places in the country that just built these 10 hospitals and didn't put any doctors in them. And he's, he implemented fines now for people who are not wearing masks. In public, so his, his, and his. When Bolsonaro launched a uh, propaganda campaign telling people not to pay attention to the governors, he launched an advertising campaign in the state of Sao Paulo, which said, "We can take care of the economy later. Let's prioritize human lives," which is very surprising. You know, I don't want to sound mm -hmm. like I'm complimenting Doria because he's a scumbag. You know, he's the, but, but I'm just glad that, like, I'm glad that Witzel's fighting with. Bolsonaro on this issue too in Rio and not just saying, okay, Bolsonaro, everything you say is fine. Let's not use, let's not do quarantine. So I think it's a good thing. As far as Moro's prospects, 
I've seen a lot of integral state actors in the American media talking about this. Oh, he's going to be a great candidate and this and that. But I remember what happened during the first lawfare operation, which was launched against the PT party in 2005, uh, the Mensa Lounge scandal, which also there was no material evidence. The, the Supreme Court justice was made into a hero by the media compared to Batman and things like that. Um, Barbosa, he was, everyone was saying he was going to be the next political, uh, the next presidential candidate. And what happened is the media, the Brazilian media just abandoned him when they didn't need him anymore. And he just disappeared from the face of the earth. I think that Moro has too much dirt against him to mount a presidential candidacy because he could be arrested at any time for a number of felonies that he's committed in the last couple of years, you know, including felonies that he committed outside of the context of Lava Jato. He was given legal um, dispensation from breaking the law as part of Lava Jato. Like they were allowed to operate above the law. But since he's been justice minister, he's broken the law repeatedly as well. Like he, he ordered the federal police not to seize former congressional president Eduardo Cunha's smartphones because he knew there was incriminating evidence against him on it, you know? Um, so I feel like he's too vulnerable to run for president. And I think that he's being used as a pawn. He's not very bright himself. He's not that charismatic in front of the cameras. When the elites don't need him anymore, they're just gonna throw him out. And so in short, I don't, and anyone in the Supreme Court can order an investigation against him, could have him arrested, not have him arrested, but you know, issue an order for his arrest. So I don't think he's got what it takes uh, to be the president, the, to run for president. Like um, Giuliano said, maybe as a vice presidential candidate with Doria. But mm -hmm. then the question arises, what party would he enter? You know, which political party? Because the right parties are all fragmented right now as well. Okay. Um, well, this call is due to go on to 5.30. Now, we don't think it's going to cut out, but it's a possibility that it could. But I'm going to try and just end on this question from Simone um, Santa Barbara. Um, it's just uh, be a nice one to end on, I think. And she says, but um, actually, just before I read it, if it does cut out, we're going to try and extend it. So just... Um, hang fire but Simone says what is interesting in Brazil is that the US um, and the UK the US da, 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 is, the, is the lack of response and challenge from the opposition on the left so there's a lack of re response and challenge from opposition on the left how would you assess the current situation of the left in Brazil and the future of it um, yeah. yeah Brian I don't or Julian do you Juliana, yeah. how do you, how do you uh, see this? I'll try and respond to that. Also, responding to a couple of other things, I think there's also a point that Matthew Richmond has has raised, which which in some way links to links to my response here. So, um, I, I suppose I, I have much less faith uh, in in the institutions of the judiciary um, uh, to, you know, than, to, than to than to hope that Moro's criminality would prevent him from being a viable presidential candidate. Uh, to, the, the judiciary is, is generally very politicized, extremely ideological, filled with, um, with, with, with uh, uh, rich, privately educated um, uh, uh, people of the Brazilian upper class. And, and the STF, the Supreme Court, is at the best of times a bordello. Um, so, so to hope that, that uh, he would be excluded because of his criminality. I, I, I don't. I don't share that idea. Um, there is a sense right now among many people on the left that what's needed is to get rid of Bolsonaro at, at all at all costs, mm -hmm. and that's led to ideas of creating a a broad front um, on, on on the left, but actually of the so-called democratic forces, essentially a, a front. A, 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 and a, a, co a coalition alliance of um, bourgeois uh, democratic parties. Um, there's been there's been a, an alliance of left wing parties, centre left and left wing parties, uh, to to call for a different sort of response to the the pandemic. But then there's also been a, a, 
a quite historic coming together of Fernando Henrique Cardoso and Lula speaking on the same platform on Workers' Day organized by trade unions. Um, I tend to have slight reservations to this approach, partly because I think it exposes the extreme difficulty in which the left finds itself right now, which is that any attempt to, to progress an agenda based around the recapture of some sort of civility exposes the left in its links to some sort of establishment. And that seems to be in some way what has separated it from a popular, popular base. Um, at the same time, I think the center right, or let's say the, the systematic organized neoliberal right is far better placed to take control of politics in Brazil, despite the, the devastating showing of the PSTP in, in the previous election, than the, the organized left, let's say the, the PT in particular, which is the main vehicle for the left in, in Brazil. There's been a sort of emptying of the left's agenda since Lula was freed. There was a, a coming together around the idea of Lula livre, free Lula from his political imprisonment, since he's been freed, it's been very difficult to understand what idea the left is proposing. Okay. So I, I, I tend to be, a, 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 see, I, I, I tend to have some sort of preoccupation about the idea that Bolsonaro could take things to such an extreme that we, we enter a situation of dictatorship or de facto dictatorship, which many would argue we're already heading towards. At the same time, I think there's a case to be made for letting the right eat itself. The government is, is, is eating itself at the moment. And, and as Brian says, you know, let, letting Doria and Witzel and, and Bolsonaro play, play, play it out amongst themselves could end up working at some point in the left's favor. And just in, in response then to Matt Richmond's question, um, I, I said at the beginning that Bolsonaro is simultaneously threatening this, this congressional horse trading system and using it to his own benefit to protect himself from criminal, potential criminal investigation of well, himself and his sons. And could, Matt's asked whether this, this involvement in, in, in congressional horse trading brings Bolsonaro back into a sort of constitutional state of, uh, state of, of, of behavior. Um, that might be the case, but it also, I think, exposes the, the, the contradictions. And that hopefully will also play into this autophagy or, or, or self-eating of, of the government and of the right. Brian, how do, you, how do you see this, this future of the left in, in Brazil? Can you also kind of, well, if sure. the presidential elections in 2022 actually go ahead, can you also see them coming together in this more kind of broad pro-democracy front? Or do you have a, a different kind of view on how this is going to play out? First of all, I just want to clarify what I said about the judiciary going after Sergio Moro. I didn't want to imply that I have any kind of faith in an objective judiciary acting in a fair way. What I think could happen is that splits in the right could cause one faction of conservative judiciary to attack Sergio Moro because they're all beginning to attack each other right now, which, as Giuliano says, is playing up to the, you know, to the favor of the left. The opportunists in the conservative coalition that backed Bolsonaro are all eating each other alive right now. And so I think it's conceivable that at some point, some conservative member of the judiciary or the federal police or whatever just decides to go after more to prevent him from running for office against another conservative. You know? But as far as the left goes, you know, I think that there's been a huge failure in the Anglo left to accurately describe what's been going on in Brazil since the 2016 coup. I mean, I've, re I've seen a lot of talk. At one point, Jacobin ran 38 consecutive articles attacking the PT during the coup period, for example, never talking about what the left's doing in resistance to the coup. Well, so there was a series of protests that put 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 people on the streets. And last year, the largest protest in, you know, the history of Brazil took place against Bolsonaro, organized by the teachers' unions and the social movements and the student movements together, uh, which put almost two million people on the streets of hundreds of cities against this attempt to start privatizing the public university system. And it was successful, you know? And so 
yeah, it's true. The left united behind the idea of getting Lula out of prison. The fact that the social movements and unions put a group of a couple hundred people constantly rotating personnel for a year and a half in front of the prison cell where Lula was being held just to yell good morning, good afternoon, and good night to him every day was an amazing achievement. You know, he got out and there's been regrouping going on, which has been hampered by the fact that leftists are obeying, you know, they're, they're following self-isolation orders. So we're in this vacuum moment when the only people going out onto the streets are, are conservatives, but they're tiny groups that are getting disproportionate media coverage. And um, there are these potbagging protests which have spread from the middle class neighborhoods out even into poor neighborhoods. I've even heard them a couple nights in the um, favela where I live on the periphery of Sao Paulo, for example, whereas for the first month, nothing, just total silence, you know? So there are some things going on. The, the big issue, I think, facing the left is that both the PT and the PISTOL, which is a smaller, a much smaller uh, self-proclaimed vanguard left party, they were kind of built on the idea of respect for the rule of law because they came out of like the PT came out of this period when there was armed revolt against the dictatorship. One of the early key players in the PT party was taken down by the lawfare attack and the Mensa Lounge scandal. Jose Zanuino was one of the leaders of the Araguaia armed revolt against the dictatorship in the 70s in the Amazon, you know. And so like the PT and the and the MST and the CUT and all of the associated unions and social movements um, built up on the idea of opening spaces of counter hegemony within existing institutions in a capitalist system to deepen democracy and enact radical reform. And we're at a time right now in Brazil when there's no more respect for democracy, the rule of law is broken down, Bolsonaro's election was illegitimate, okay? And so, I personally am losing faith in the electoral process in Brazil. And so how can a party, like even the fact that Lula, unlike Rafael Correa and other left leaders who were attacked by the US-backed Lava Jato operation and this lawfare attack to take out the Latin American left, you know, unlike Evo Morales and Rafael Correa who fled their countries when, when they came for them, Lula was like, no, I'm going to let them arrest me and prove my innocence because I have so much respect for the rule of law. Mm -hmm. So we're in a situation where the rule of law is broken down. The 2018 elections were not legitimate at all. They were totally illegitimate. I mean, they broke UN law, which is legally binding in the U.S. when they blocked Lula's candidacy, candidacy one month before the election. They illegally leaked slander against Haddad one week before the election. There's this fake news attack convincing a large percentage of the electorate that Haddad was giving out baby bottles with penis-shaped nipples on them in the public school system in Sao Paulo. It was totally illegitimate, mm. okay? And uh, Dilma's removal was illegitimate. So why, I, my worry is that there's all this attempt at building coalition right now between reestablishing the coalition between the center left parties and some of the right wing parties that led to four consecutive presidential election victories spearheaded by modern young governor Flavio Dino right now, you know, with adhesion from the PT and everything. I feel like maybe the, the left is putting too much faith in the electoral process, mm -hmm. but I don't see what they're going to do. The only you know, left-wing political party in Brazil that doesn't respect elections and doesn't believe in elections is the tiny PCR, the Revolutionary Communist Party, which has one social movement attached to it, the Movimento de Luto dos Barrios, which is a housing movement operating in like seven states. I don't see, I don't see how the left is going to get around this for 2022, because I just feel like if a left candidate starts winning in the polls again, they're just going to remove them from the elections. Sure. Um, well, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Juliana. Unfortunately, I think we're going to have to leave the discussion there because we've already run over um, quite substantially. But it's just been absolutely fascinating. So I do want to thank both both of you for joining us um, today and you know sharing your perspective with us. It just seems to me that it's such a volatile moment in Brazil at the moment that we're probably going to have to 
do this again at some point quite soon um, so it seems that things are, are developing quite rapidly so so thanks again for for joining us um, and thanks to everyone who's participated as well everyone who's kind of tuned in and listened to us um, our second event Alborada's online um, all I'd like to say is just remind everyone that we are doing another um, another one of these kind of Q&A sessions but on Venezuela next Tuesday um, so if you want to put that in your diaries and join us for that that looks set to be really interesting as well um, and of course yeah check out Alborada's website we are kind of an independent media um, platform and we do rely on donations so you can support us under the support uh, tab on our web page but thanks again everyone and, and thanks again for for joining us and hopefully i'll see you all soon okay thanks very much thanks everyone